the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. David Geslack started Exercise Connection in 2009 to improve the health and well-being of those with autism through exercise. Nine universities have adopted his program into their adapted physical education and special education programs. He has presented on exercise and autism in countries around the world, including Egypt, Dubai, and Russia. And now I'll turn it over to David Getlack. Thanks, Denise, and thanks everyone at ARI for having me. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to uh, present again. And for all everyone attending and watching, um, first and foremost, I hope everyone is safe, healthy, and your family and children or the students, everyone you work with are okay. Um, so today's talk, if you haven't seen me present, um, really, or if you, if you have seen me present, a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about still stem um, from maybe what you've heard in the past. Um, but I will try to highlight throughout this talk of some more resources or um, strategies for um, helping your children or students exercising at home during COVID-19. Um, and I will leave 10 minutes at the end. If you do have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer as many as I can. So briefly, just about my background, um, just to follow up, I think one of the biggest things that um, why I and, and my team have had so much success is that I've been a paraeducator, I have been a fitness coordinator at a therapeutic day school for those with autism, and along with many of my team, um, I have special education teachers, speech language pathologists, and who have all been former um, paraeducators as well. So we are humbled and blessed and thankful to be creating programs for this community, um, but also that I believe this is why a lot of our programs are now uh, supported in research and evidence-based and both the professionals and families and ultimately children are having success using them. Um, one thing to note, if you are from overseas or specifically in Russia, um, my book is now um, published in Russian. Um, so there's, there's some resources there for where to obtain it, um, either online or um, in, I guess, their largest chain of bookstores. Um, so you can see there that there's a print cover. And then I actually had them change it because uh, I, I wasn't made aware of the picture they were using. Not that it didn't share me on it, but more importantly, that it wasn't misleading to families. Um, and and while I, what I mean by that is that that exercise um, that the child is doing on the left side, there's no question someone with autism can do that um, given the right strategies. But as you see on the right, um, I'm using a whiteboard, a visual support with that student and or with that client and um, this is maybe a more realistic beginning exercise that you may do with your kids. And so my biggest thing is today and always has been to share with you tried and true exercises and protocols uh, that I've done with all children and adults on the spectrum of all ability levels. So today's workshop, if you can have a little fun here and participate with me, um, but just read this out loud as things come up on the screen. I agree to listen to David as he teaches. Oh, sorry. I have to move something. I agree to listen to David as he teaches exercise. Teaches me about exercise for those with autism. I agree to pay attention and try not fall asleep. I agree to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Today I will leave with a greater understanding of how I can incorporate exercise into my child's or your student's routine. So as many of you may be familiar with this and what this is, is this is a social story. 
So in, in times like today, uh, where a lot of your children or students were abruptly but understandably taken out of their normal routine, it's probably even more critical that if you're teaching them exercise or attempting to teach them anything at home, that you embed this evidence-based practice known as a social narrative or commonly known as a social story. Um, over the years, and still to this day, this is what I find is when I go into PE, APE um, programs uh, and a lot of exercise-based programs, there's many still not using not only this evidence-based practice, but others. And that's a problem. The way that our children learn or these students or individuals learn in the classroom still, unfortunately, to this day, haven't fully transferred to a physical education or an adaptive physical education or exercise setting. So this is one way for you as a parent or a professional teaching a parent that you can start to maybe create just a mock social story or a mock social narrative of preparing that student or that child or your child of what is about to happen for the next 10, 20, 30 minutes of exercise. Our mission is simple. It's, we're committed to help to using exercise to transform the lives of those impacted with autism. And we've been building breakthrough products to empower both educators, professionals, and parents. And as we like to say, we are giving hope an action plan. So if you aren't familiar, these are some of the benefits that support or that have been proven through research to help to support exercise for those with autism. Now, as you can see, we have decreases repetitive behaviors, increased on task behavior, communication, social skills, and even academics. And what I want you to know about this research, while it is important and while it is, uh, it is it's very important, it's based on 60 minutes of high intensity activity. Now, again, still very important, but the challenges is both a parent or a professional is you, under, you probably will understand that your child or students will not be able to do a high intensity exercise in the beginning, maybe even months later, or even years of incorporating exercise because it's hard for them or anyone to get their heart rate above 80% maximal effort, which would define high intensity exercise. So 80% of their maximal heart rate is what this is based on, which again is very important and research has expanded. But I wanna share what is what I think is um, some breakthrough research that has now been recently done. In 2017, out of Rutgers University, they found that 10 minutes of low intensity exercise can reduce self-stimulatory behaviors for the next 60 minutes, specifically echolalia and hand flapping. Powerful, powerful research. And I think to give you as parents and professionals right now in this time of COVID-19 or potentially when things get quote unquote back to normal, these are 10 minutes is a realistic expectation for you as the parent, the professional, and for your child or student to achieve a realistic goal and, and look at the benefits it can have. Now, the two modalities chosen in this research study were a bike or a treadmill. Now, many of you may not have this. Many of you may not be able to afford this, and same with the school. So what I'm gonna share with you as we go through is you're gonna see some videos and you're gonna see some things that you don't have to use in these exercises or these modalities are really uh, very high cost pieces of equipment. Um, and in my case studies, I have seen a lot of the, the benefits that the research is, is showing but again, with the use of no equipment at all or very limited or cost-effective equipment to both the families and the schools and professionals. The other thing that is, um, as parents you may not know, or professionals, is uh, out of Arizona State University, uh, Dr. Adams performed one of the largest um, 
surveys uh, or specifically asking autism parents. And they found parents rated exercise as the number one overall treatment. They found, again, here's the, what everything uh, what was surveyed. And uh, the reason there is a star above speech therapy is because that was one of the most common therapies that all students or all parents surveyed that their children were involved in. But again, a big impact in showing that exercise is, is making a difference in their lives and in their child's lives. And what also what I want to share with you and point out is that exercise does not replace physical therapy or occupational therapy. They absolutely, and those therapists have a role in your children's development. But exercise should not be viewed as a therapy or even sport. And I'm going to talk about that as we move along. So in this video, um, you're going to see a boy. His name is Rowan. He was three and a half when I first started with him. And this is a year after. Now, we worked out or he worked out once a week for 60 minutes. That doesn't mean he was actually exercising for 60 minutes. It was just that he was involved with me for 60 minutes. He was still going to OT. He was still had a speech pathology, pathologist. He was developmental therapy, and he was still going to his school. But here you're gonna see, um, again, a year after him using visual supports, him doing some exercises that you wouldn't commonly see for a kid his age, or for, in, for the fact in that matter that any individual with autism. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and play this video. So a couple of things I want to point out in that video, um, that was obviously done at the home, which to, to hopefully empower and inspire some of you. Um, one thing that he was using or we used initially when I sat with his mom when I first started and his, and his dad and actually the speech therapist is they didn't have an exercise mat, but he liked that blanket. So that was more sense, it gave him a little bit more um, comfort, uh, some, some sensory feedback from the softness of the blanket. So that was his exercise mat. And 
<clears throat> yes, he was using dumbbells, uh, which I saw improvement in uh, motor planning, uh, strength, and as many hear this, a muscle tone. Um, but it doesn't mean that you should all be using dumbbells for your children or your students. Okay. Um, the next phase or the next part is I want to emphasize that when we're talking about these programs and what I'm showing you, obviously I showed you a, a video of, of, of Rowan who was four and a half, but um, the programming and the, and the protocols that we use have worked with all students or all individuals of all ages and ability levels uh, with autism. So this is not just for children or this is not just for adults. It is, it is for all ability levels and age groups. And why it can service all of these kids uh, or adults in this community is, is focusing on, as I started with, evidence-based practices. Now, these are a list of many of the evidence-based practices that our children have been using or used in the past. Um, and one of those, which you may not be aware, is exercise. Exercise is deemed an evidence-based practice. And it's shown that it can increase it by having an increase in physical exertion or physical activity as a means it can it has a means of reducing problem behaviors or increasing appropriate behavior. But here's the thing. You can't just throw our kids or your children into an exercise setting or start to teach exercise if you don't have one or many of those other evidence based practices listed like visual supports, video modeling, prompting, social narratives. If you don't have those made a part of an exercise program, you, you, in many cases, will not see this response of reduced problem behaviors or increased appropriate behavior. We know evidence-based practices are important, right? I don't need to go into the definition, but this is, again, how these children learn in the classroom and we need to use those same practices in an exercise setting or a home-based exercise setting. I already talked about social narratives as we went through this, but I do want you to see, uh, or as we started, but I do want you to see um, Brody reading a social narrative or an exercise story on Exercise Buddy. And the things I wanna point out is you'll see my reduced level of prompting, specifically verbal prompting, um, and I'm just pointing, but you're gonna hear him have some echolalia and, repeat it and uh, repeating a phrase of lightning bugs. But what you're gonna see is this is how we would start every session in his home, and he would get through this, extra, or this social narrative. Um, he was also, his responses or his requests were one word responses or requests, but you can obviously hear him trying and attempting and completing reading a social narrative. If your child is nonverbal, uh, you know him or her better than I, so they may be able to read through it, but you reading it to them is still critical and very important. And I'll share a little bit more about Exercise Buddy here as we move along. Um, visual supports. Look, 
the special education classroom, many of your homes are engulfed with visuals, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. If you're not implementing visuals, not only an exercise, a very challenging task, um, or any new task, you may be setting a lot of your children or your students up for failure. So again, especially with exercise, I think it's important not only for the child to see the visual, but maybe even mom, dad, the paraeducator, or someone who isn't an exercise professional to remember, oh, this is what a hip extension is, or this is what I'm supposed to do. A visual support is critical. So I'm actually not gonna show this video, but actually I'll show it. Um, here's Rowan using the schedule that we had embedded, uh, that I had embedded, but in the very beginning, um, he was using big eight and a half by 11 visuals. We eventually moved to this, but actually here, he would do all of these exercises, but he only did them, if you remember in the original video, that first video, he was doing them for like 10 or 15 seconds. And, and I say that in a positive way. He got through over 15, 20 exercises, but that's still a lot of movement, a lot of activity for someone just starting. So I wanna emphasize that to you as parents and uh, professionals, is just getting them started is half the battle. And, and again, remember, 10 minutes should be your first initial goal for your children or your students. So David, we're not hearing the audio on the video for this oh, one. Okay. Could you describe to us what he's doing? Yeah, <clears throat> so I'm sorry you guys can't hear the audio. He is just taking the visuals himself. He's essentially owning the program, which I'll talk to talk about shortly. Um, but it just shows that he took ownership, he said it, I didn't, and now he's gonna perform it or he does it. So I think that's a very important thing as you're working with your kids, if you can get them to own the program or to, as opposed to them in many settings are told what to do, here he has some ownership. We do have paper-based visual exercise systems on our website. So if that's something you may be interested, I just want you guys to be aware. Um, and then the other thing that may be more, uh, that may be useful for many of your children is uh, technology aided instruction, another evidence-based practice, but specifically our application exercise buddy. So you're gonna see Rowan use exercise buddy, which we've embedded a number of evidence-based practices and teaching protocols, and exercise buddy is now supported in five research studies, independent research studies. So since you can't hear this, I'll kind of narrate you through it. Exercise Buddy has music um, that plays in the background, but now you see Rowan. Now here, he's about, I think, nine years old, but he was able to transition from a paper-based uh, resource to technology. Um, now, not all of your children or students, technology could be a major distraction for them. So just be aware, um, but at the end of the day, we need and they need visual supports. Uh, Exercise Buddy has video models, it has a number of things that are already embedded, and as professionals or parents, you can create your own visual, your own video model, and set it up in a first then board or a schedule. So if I haven't kind of emphasized all this already, but these are our five standards. Um, one is use visuals. Two is build the relationship. Three is create a structured routine. Four is follow the five components. And five is applying cross-curriculum. So again, exercise is used at home or throughout their daily living. We need to use it in exercise. And if you don't have the technology or our paper-based system, that's all right. But you have to have visuals, as you can see below there. Um, create your own, go to Google, whatever it is. But I promise you, 
it is worth the effort to have these visuals in front of your children or your uh, students, especially when teaching exercise, which can be very challenging for many of them. Um, build the relationship. This is one of the most, I think, important and eye-opening pieces of research that I saw in relation to um, helping those with autism. And, and to sum the research up, it says a facilitator, parent, or other having a visible acceptance of enjoyment and warmth are significantly related to increases in the child's language, social competence, joint attention, and self-regulation. Look, I was a paraeducator, um, and some days are tough. And I'm specifically talking with par uh, to the professionals here. But whatever is happening in our lives, and, and, and even if you've just been bit, hit, scratched, pinched, hair pulled, we have to show acceptance, be warm, and be genuine in what we're doing to help these kids. And again, I know it can be tough, but I can promise you um, I've been in parents' homes, but that doesn't mean I've been in their shoes. So whatever we can do to support and make their children's day better and do this, it's going to go well beyond what the actual task is we're teaching them, right? It's going to go beyond exercise or uh, some school-based work. But look what you just being genuine and warm and, and, and doing could, can do to to the, this community. To follow up with that and building the relationship, when you're teaching exercise, perfection is not the goal. Persistence is. Now, there probably are some PTs or OTs listening to me, and, um, and I fully understand the biomechanics of the human body and why things need to be in place or in the right motor pattern. But when we're starting to get our children to exercise, which is very challenging, it's not about being perfect. It's just about getting them moving. It's just about trying to get to 10 minutes. So hopefully, hopefully we can see the benefits that it can have for them. You as a parent or you as a professional have, will have that opportunity to coach them right, and coach them to be, a, to be more um, efficient in their movement pattern or efficient in that exercise. But in the beginning, I'm gonna stress to you, don't tell them stop, no, try again. In many cases, they hear that too much throughout their day, right? Remember, exercise is often taught in, in the most unsensory friendly environment or environments, PE class, with tons of children running around or in an exercise setting where maybe things are dropped and loud, right? So perfection is not the goal, persistence is. So again, follow up on that. Here, this is a, just a quick visual and a story, but Bill was 25 years old when I started working with him and he couldn't catch a ball. He couldn't catch a ball just standing there. Five years later, in a progression, and, and then this took a lot of time, but not only can he catch a ball, but he can do it with both hands on while kneeling on a stability ball. And this goes to building the relationship. This goes to understanding him and the resources and the evidence-based practices and the breakdown or the task analysis of how he would learn best. And I think, unfortunately, back then, and in many cases, these children aren't challenged in the PE setting, and they can be, but you need those evidence-based practices, and you need to be able to build that relationship. And lastly, I think if there are PE or APE teachers listening, but I recognize your job is extremely tough when you are flooded with, with many different students, um, and you often don't have that opportunity, as I did in many of my cases, to really build that relationship in a one-to-one -one approach. Um, but I think by still instilling those evidence-based practices, teaching the paraeducators or any support staff, 
um, that will also help that children, those children or students understand that you get understand them. You know how they learn best and you want to see them succeed. Number three, establish a structured routine. Um, look, I'm showing you things in videos where maybe this isn't how your ch child learns best. And that's okay. Meaning, just because you saw Rowan do something, don't go and try that with your student or with your child. Right? If you know how they learn best, whether it's a first end board, a start finish schedule, or some other thing that has your child or student learning successfully in PT, OT, or, or in the classroom, then take that same structure, embed it at home, and add the exercise visuals to it, or the, or the video models, or whatever it is how they learn. But we know that they need structure, and it may simply be starting with, hey, on Monday, we're going to do this exercise. We're going to do two exercises for five minutes, and we're going to follow that up. I will do it again next Monday and slowly build on that, both on the amount of days and the amount of time you're adding to the session. Um, I hope that is clear. And as I mentioned earlier, give them ownership. Right. This was a long time ago. Um, and you see in the pictures there where I had these big visuals and I would have this student or client who was nonverbal tap and pick the exercise. I was able to control what exercises I wanted him to do, but he was able to pick. So he had ownership. And if you remember from that video, that first video, Rowan, it, it said he said um, his magic number. So I was again able to control the time or the repetition to the exercise, but he was able to choose it. So again, this is another way to give them ownership um, of that program. When you're designing a program, it this could be a benefit to you um, is doing what I call like a down, up, down approach. On the left there, you see a person doing something on the ground, then they can stand up, and then they go back down on the ground. So if, think of this as three exercises in a row. Now this does two things. One, it can help your children burn even just a little bit more calories from that up, down, up approach, or down, uh, down up, down. But it also, um, this is many things that PTs and OTs are working on, like functional daily living, right? Getting up and down. Um, which can be a challenge for their for our community. So now you can try to embed that into the exercise routine so you're getting even more benefits. Um, and it's done maybe not so in a, uh, yeah, that's all I'm gonna say. Um, in that structured program, in building the relationship, use reinforcements, which is another evidence-based practice practice. So here, this student would always get, he liked musical composers. So after um, his workout session, he would be able to um, cut out a musical composer and put it in his exercise journal. And this instructor had him write and say what his favorite exercise was that day. Here, um, we had, I was using games and preferred activities to motivate this individual to exercise. Um, this was an angry bird simulation and movement on the, on the left. And on the right, um, you see me reading to him. I would literally read to him for nearly 60 minutes. And he would follow a visual schedule and do everything I asked, as long as I read books. So think about that as you're building programs. The EC, the exercise connection, five components. These are the areas of the body that I found have been most challenged for our students or our kids. And uh, one is body image. Um, simply identifying body parts uh, can be a way that you want to start, but also it, and that can involve movement. Um, but that's what we're primarily looking at is body image, um, posture. In posture, I'm looking at dynamic and static flexibility exercises. Motor coordination is something as parents you hear about 
early on in uh, since their diagnosis, but you can absolutely do motor coordination activities that are fitness based uh, or and or that support any um, PT or OT and what they're doing. Um, muscular fitness exercises, cardiovascular fitness exercises. I think cardio could be one of the most challenging things to teach to our children. Um, so I have more information I can only share about that. And lastly, we know most of our children and most of anyone <laughs> that we have weak abdominals. Um, and that could really fall under a postural based or a muscular fitness based activity. But any abdominal strength activity is critical and helpful for our children. Um, as you look at videos that I've done or hear more, um, one of the biggest things that I focus on is movement first and sport second. So let me explain that. Sport is a way for anyone or our children to get physical activity, no question. Um, but from my experience over the last 16 years, um, a lot of the kids and adults that I've worked with, they don't want to be basketball players. They don't want to be football players. But there's some that may be, right? But I think the majority don't. And why I also say that is sport involves two of the most difficult things and characteristics of autism, social skills and communication. So if you have put your children into that, those different um, sport activities or even Special Olympics, that's great. And, it, and, it, and, and I'm not knocking that. But if they haven't had success with that, that could be why. It's very challenging um, for that social skills and communication standpoint. If sport is the motivator for your kid, then absolutely continue it and absolutely keep them involved. But what I'm looking and have been designing programs is how can maybe if some of you listening go to the gym or not right now but go work out and do things independently put on your headphones and go and exercise that may be more deemed maybe setting your children up for success by creating protocols like that but that are not sport based so that's what i mean by movement first sport second Applying cross-curriculum. If you remember from the second or third slide, what, what exercise can do to help our kids. Um, and it goes beyond just the health-related benefits. So um, as your children get back into schools, as you start to go to IEP meetings, um, I have plenty of research to share. Um, and one of that research being that IDEA law mandates physical activity for those with special needs, um, it's something you may want to bring up and make sure your kid's involved in, obviously from a PE, APE setting, but also it's to share this research with your um, IEP team about the benefits of exercise, it absolutely should be in, ingrained in a classroom setting. Um, so we have a little bit of time, I'll just show you briefly a little bit more about Exercise Buddy, because I think this can be a resource for many of you to try, and we do have a 14-day free trial um, of this. And if you need an extension, if you're on here and you're listening, we're happy to give you an extend a free trial. Just email us and say, I saw Coach Dave's webinar on Autism Research Institute, and uh, we're happy to extend your trial. Exercise Buddy embeds five evidence-based practices that we've been talking about. Um, you don't need Wi-Fi. Uh, you can save unlimited workouts, it collects data, prints reports, and you can create custom visuals and videos. Uh, but you do have to be on Wi-Fi for that feature. But once they're created and saved, it's up there. Um, we have, um, it's only compatible with iPads, Android tablets, sorry for the typo, and Google Chromebooks. Um, it's not for phones. And once you get in it and see, and it, it just could cause too much error for the individual with autism, special needs, or even the instructor using it. We, you need the bigger screen, but it does work on iPad minis. 
Um, we have a number of universities researching it and uh, universities using it in their curriculum. And actually, we recently did have a fifth study uh, that supports it that was also done, if you see there, in 2018 by uh, um, the BCBA. And she did her second study now, and so ultimately the fifth one that supports Exercise Buddy. And again, we have some of that research that we can send to you um, if you need or want more information. So before I start taking questions, I want to give you a few exercises that you've kind of seen um, that's, that you can do at home. So one I talked about is body part identification. Look, think of the game that we probably all played, right? Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. So not only are you teaching them their body parts and that, but even to get them to touch their knees and then touch their toes and bend over and have some stretching, have some flexibility, that could be a lot for your kids, right? So don't think that exercise, you, they need to be dripping in sweat, right? We just need to start to get them moving and we need to start to get them used to getting maybe their bodies off the couch or out uh, away from the screens and just start to get them moving, okay? So again, take a slow approach to this, um, use the evidence-based practices, and I promise you that you will start to see some progression. It, it, may not be, it may not be easy, both for you and for the child, but it is definitely worth the effort. Supermans, um, this is an exercise where it's involving a number of things. Um, it's involving abdominal work, crossing midline of the body, muscles of the shoulder girdle, and muscles of the glutes and hamstrings. And um, when you break this down, this could actually be five different exercises, but, it, but this is something that I feel is, we have, we, this is what we teach and we have some videos on this, but um, you have to break it down, but this is again involving no equipment, it has multiple benefits, um, not just uh, abdominal, as I see this as a nice replacement for a crunch, but they're getting proprioceptive feedback. Again, they're crossing midline of the body by touching their opposite hand to their opposite knee and then extending out. You saw Rowan on this, and this is a log stretch. Um, why I like this, and, and you can find these now relatively easy, um, and they're relatively inexpensive. You can find them sometimes for $20, but it not only is this good for the child, but also even for mom and dad or anyone. Um, by just laying on this log, you're helping to improve posture, reduce tension in the neck and spine. Um, for some kids, when they get on it, or adults, they may be a little bit shaky and a little bit wobbly. And that's because their abdominals aren't working as they should be or contracting or engaged. So even here, you're getting um, engagement of the abdominals and they're getting sensory feedback by the pressure of gravity coming on and even stretching out their chest muscles. So there's a lot happening even right there. So I think it's again, a great activity. On exercise buddy, we do have, a, I think it's like over 20 different pre-programmed at-home workouts um, that are also pre-programmed in there. So something for you to also know. Um, you saw Rowan do this, and I think great exercise to start, not asking too much of the kids, or your, but also has so many benefits. And this is just simply a hip extension, lifting your butt up and down. You're getting some abdominal work, but you're mainly getting glute and hamstring work. Um, and why that's important is because when most of us or our children, usually more adults, have low back pain, it's not because your low back is weak. It's because your glutes and hamstrings aren't working. Um, and if you're a fitness fanatic and you see now that this is like the big exercise to do and they're putting like 100 pound plates on their hips, you don't need to do that. All right, you're gonna see, and many of those people will see enough benefits starting here. Um, you don't need 100 pound plates on your hips, trust me. Um, but this is a great start 
um, and a great activity look for your child or for you to do alongside your child. Um, in the future, when things get hopefully a little bit back to normal, we were supposed to have, um, we had to cancel a number of workshops, but we do have an autism exercise specialist certificate. Um, you can go to that website, autismexercisespecialistcertificate.com to learn a little bit more and everyone who qualifies. That is also supported in research. And lastly, I'm going to take some questions, but I, again, appreciate the opportunity to present. And if you do want any more information about Exercise Buddy or just sign up for that free trial, which I think can be helpful for many of you, um, just go to exercisebuddy.com. And again, if you, um, want, if you need an extension, we're happy to extend that trial. Um, just email us. Let us know you saw this webinar, the ARI webinar, and we'll, and we'll extend you for another 14 days, okay? Um, so with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions. So David, I was saying the very first one that I got was about motivation. So you talked a lot about visual supports and touched a little bit on that. But what are some, just some strategies that you've seen maybe with a, say a teenager who's resistant to exercise? Um, what are things that you've seen be successful? Yeah, I think that's like the million dollar question that I often get. And trust me, parents and professionals, if I had the answer, I would give it to you. Um, but to specifically, just when you said the teenager, um, one of the individuals I worked with, and hopefully this will give you guys some thoughts, but one of the individuals I worked with was a boy named Anthony. He was um, 13 when I started with him. And one of the things he liked was comic books. So I had to bring a comic book to him with parent approval, but for the first, I don't know, couple months every week, but that was the motivator. Um, but as I started to fade that away and remind him and help prompt him to have better posture and things, I would relate everything to a comic book character. Uh, like we were doing an activity and he had poor posture where if you can see me, his shoulders were rolled over and I said, Anthony, let me see you have a Superman chest. I didn't have to touch him. I didn't have to prompt him. It was, whoosh, and he had better posture. So I think that um, that could be, you know, to, to find those things as parents or professionals or professionals ask the parents, you know, find what that motivator is and try to embed that um, into their into their routine. And, and yes, you're going to have to be creative or think outside the box. Um, but I hope that have, helps answer that question. Okay, another question is about sound. So sound sensitivity, when people are in a gym, sometimes it's really noisy or a basketball court, PE, that sort of thing. So have you used any sort of modifications to make that more comfortable? I know sometimes students wear headphones or different things. Are there ways to do that without, without hampering your efforts to exercise? Yeah, I think, um, no, I mean, headphones, when I was teaching at the school, um, a lot of my kids had headphones, uh, and there was no issue with them exercising, um, obvious, and, and yeah, so, and then in, in the gym type setting, if, if you were going to a, a public gym, I would say, I would say that you know, to prepare the staff in some way and let them know maybe that your son with autism is coming in. Um, but I didn't see a lot of that uh, hamper their exercise program. It's just, yeah. So for, for individuals who have very high sensitivity to proprioceptive input, You've, I'm sure you've dealt with that a lot. So do you have thoughts specifically about working with those kids, like a way to maybe ease them into it or how, how it can be less, uh, less sensory overload for them? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you said it, it's just, we just need to ease them into it, um, whether it's the environment and or the exercises. Uh, and that goes back to what I was saying about, you know, that set realistic, achievable goals of, you know, maybe tomorrow you go and work with your kid and we're just going to spend five minutes. And then what exercises are you going to do? Well, maybe it's something simple like I showed you of a hip extension, right? You're not asking too much um, by them lifting up their hips. 
and, and maybe you modeling it with them. Um, so I think that is a great exercise and, and way to think about it. The other thing is, depending if they need sensory feedback, um, you know, finding things like, like I think for some students, dumbbells can be very effective um, or for some individuals. Um, even laying on the log, you know, that is going to provide them some proprioceptive feedback. So if they need that, um, maybe you're looking at strategies like that. And remember, you don't need dumbbells. I mean, you could, you know, use, um, you know, uh, empty water bottles filled with sand or something. Even if you remember in that Superman where they're touching opposite arm, opposite knee, maybe they're holding a very light weight and that's giving some more proprioceptive feedback and they see where they're, and they can more so feel their body and their awareness and have more awareness of the space that they're in. Okay. Does that help? Yes. So, hey, David, can I ask you a favor? Could you put your slides back to full frame? Yes. Sorry. That'd be great. I'm recording, so I want to make sure I get it that way. So uh, the next question is about, this person is asking about the professional training that you discussed. Now, is that mm -hmm. available only to, <clears throat> to licensed professionals, or can parents attend those trainings? So that's the one thing, unfortunately, is just parents can't attend. Um, the it's it's more so anyone who's a licensed professional that you can see um, if you go to the website um, because this is through the american college of sports medicine which is the world's largest exercise science organization um, so that was all they, they just wouldn't allow parents because of it, just based on the background that being said um, it, i've traveled the world and in the United States to put on trainings for parents. Um, so if that is something that anyone is interested in knowing more about, if you just email me, happy to, to kind of walk you through that and how we can make that work when things return back to normal in your community or your state or, or anywhere that you are. Okay, and so here's a question about um, working out at home. I know you've mentioned the 14-day trial that you've got through the app that, that you work on. This parent's asking about just knowing how what to pick once they're there. So if they're involved and they're just getting started, this person has a seven-year-old. So mm -hmm. where would you point them if they were, or will the app sort of walk them through that if that's what they decide to do? Yeah, if the if the app can be beneficial for uh, the person asking the question, um, we have in the workout section there is an at home workout tab. There's a actually excuse me. There's a Coach Dave workout tab, and then you can filter through at home workouts. Um, so that'll kind of give you. Those are really intended as being great starting points. Um, the other thing is I would encourage uh, anyone to go to our website and it can lead you to a number of different um, videos that we have online um, that can also be strategies. I also have a book um, which has about 40 different, over 40 exercises with a visual there um, that could be a great starting point for you or for anyone you know, that's, that's doing things at home with their kids. So PE teachers are teaching online right now <laughs> and looking for lots of good ideas. Um, do you have thoughts about resources for them or are there resources in that application that would be relevant for a teacher? So, yeah, I think, you know, the, the, obviously our whole world has been turned upside down and here's my thoughts on the PE, PE teachers. Look, I'm not here, Denise, or anyone listening. I'm here to provide resources, and we've created these evidence-based resources. So I don't want you guys to think of this as a sales presentation. It's really to educate you. Um, that being said, when you go, what I'm seeing in the PE, APE world, and then presenting, giving them resources virtually, I'm sure for many it works um, to go on to Zoom or to do these things. But think about this for our kids, right? Teaching them to go on and sit in front of a computer may be a little bit easier, but to now go and access Zoom and then learn how to exercise following Zoom or whatever the, re, you know, the, the resource is, that could be a whole another teaching protocol that you may have to spend time with 
right? Like weeks to prepare them and educate them. Hey, you're going to sit here. You're going to do this. You're going to follow your teacher who's on the screen. So I think, again, I'm not saying that exercise buddy will solve and work the problem for every parent, every PE teacher, or every kid with on the spectrum, but it can work for many. And then once you see it and it embeds those first end boards, those start finish schedules, social narratives, everything that they're accustomed, many of them are accustomed to using, um, I think it can help a lot. And that's again why I think the research and, and what the research is supporting and why you're seeing people using it and across the world and researchers obviously researching it because it's a, it's a valuable tool.